I met Evan before I was kind of designing this new class because I knew I wanted to do web programming and I knew I wasn't going to be good enough to be a good JavaScript programmer and I knew I was you know, okay enough to be an ML programmer and so I wanted to learn Elm because it made it really easy to write web apps and it was you know, great and I have had a lot of fun teaching Elm uh, the past few years. But so today what I'll be talking about is uh, something different, a project that uh, my students and I are working on at the University of Chicago. Um, but before I tell you about the project, I want to give you just a very uh, quick bit of background. So I'm really lucky. I get to basically teach and do research on ideas that I love. And one of the ideas I love is functional programming. I think there are a lot of really great uh, functional programming languages that you know, share kind of a common core of building blocks, but of course have a bunch of different you know, features. I think they're all great. I think it's all worth learning. It's all, all to the good. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm essentially going to treat these languages as all the same. And that's because in each of these languages, the way that we write programs looks something like this. Right? We've got a big text box where we punch in our program. Then we've got a bunch of other boxes with more text to help explain our program. And now, of course, building complex software is you know, a huge engineering challenge. So I'm not arguing that the complexity can go away. But what I am interested in is whether we can augment the text-based representation of programs with more intuitive and interactive ways of specifying that program. OK, and so this question of can we augment text-based programming with direct manipulation is really the question that my research group um, is interested in. And so over the past few years, we've been devel developing a, a prototype research IDE called Sketch and Sketch, which is a clean slate, bare bones IDE. Um, there's you know, a single text box with you know, a single uh, program. There's a single output pane. And we're using this as kind of a, you know, um, experiment, a, kind of a, a laboratory for experimenting with you know, what we can add to it. And so a couple of things we've been you know, thinking about are, can we allow the user to directly manipulate the output of the program and automatically synthesize or infer some program change to match what they've done? Um, we've kind of reported some initial ideas uh, in this direction in a few different papers. And a couple of years ago, we had a demo of an early version of this system. Um, if you're you know, interested in learning more, please take a look at our project page. We've got some demos and, and things to read. Another idea we've been exploring is whether we can add direct manipulation to the code box itself. OK, so in, in addition to unrestricted text edits, can we add direct manipulation interactions to perform certain text-based transformations? So we recently kind of reported an initial idea in this direction, and we're currently working on scaling this idea up for a more full-featured uh, subset of an Elm-like language. OK, and that's what I'll be talking about today. And so our work in this direction really starts with a really simple user interface idea, and that's to augment the text or the concrete syntax of our program with structure, abstract syntax information, directly on top of the text. OK, so our goal here is a user interface that integrates text and structured editing. And so we've been developing this editor, uh, which we call Deuce, because we're trying to integrate um, both text and structured editing. And so what I'll do for the next you know, 10 or 15 minutes is kind of give a, a demo on a simple example that I like to use a lot, the example of uh, building the Sketch and Sketch logo, this little Lambda pattern here. And so we'll, we'll prototype, we'll repair, we'll refactor our program to, to achieve this task. And over the course of this little, the life of this little file, I'd like you to hopefully get a sense that we can kind of integrate text and structured editing in kind of a, you know, a tight, nice way. OK, so let's head over to the, the demo. OK, so here's a current build of Sketch and Sketch. And to get started, I'm just going to draw a few shapes that um, will constitute my you know, eventual logo. And I'll draw an X to start, and we'll make it look like a lambda later on. OK, and so we're in text editing mode. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll do is say, well, you know, line one is underneath line two, so maybe I'll use normal text edits to rearrange these definitions, get rid of extra white space. Um, OK, so that little you know, rearranging of definitions is already kind of a tedious operation to do with text edits. And so let's show how, instead of being in text editing mode, you can kind of see at the, the bottom left corner of the screen here, if we shift into deuce or structured editing mode, now when we hover over the text box, we can identify different you know, sub-expressions and other elements in our AST, things like you know, constants at the leaves of our tree. We can um, uh, select uh, function applications in our tree. We can select patterns, equations, even the white space in between definitions. OK, and so if we select the rectangle definition and the white space at the top of our program, 
Deuce pops up this little menu of transformations that you know, might be relevant based on what we've selected. In this case, we've got this one move definition tool that will move the selected definition to that white space. OK, and so when I hover over this menu, it's showing me a preview of what you know, the transformation will do, and then I can click to invoke it. And it's going to take care of you know, the details of getting the white space and formatting right. OK, the next thing that I want to do now is you know, I notice that, you know, of course, these shapes aren't really connected yet. And so I want to add a, you know, variables to denote the top left corner of my design and have all of those shapes anchored to it. And so one way that we can do this using uh, uh, structured edits is to say, well, we can select the four x values in our definitions. And one of the tools that pops up is called make equal by introducing a new variable into our program and replacing those selections with that variable. OK, and so here it's trying to pick a couple of reasonable names that you know, might be you know, useful, x, x1, and so on. And so we'll just choose that option. And notice how you know, all those three uh, selections have been, have been replaced by x. The next thing we'll do is select the three y values and again, make them equal by introducing a new variable y. Um, and at this point, you know, we can just test out that, yes, they're all anchored at the top right corner. Now let's say you know, I want a square logo, and so I'll select all of my constants that are involved with, um, with that aspect. You know, there's a bunch of different names. Maybe they're not great, so I'll just quickly, you know, just like in any other refactoring tool, rename that to, to size. OK, so so far, you know, right now we've been in this structured editing mode where we're just hovering over things in the, in the text box and selecting them. Um, the idea, though, is you know, you know, we hope that we can, we will want to use both text and structured edits kind of in a more intermingled way. And so if we go back to text mode, and I'll kind of just kind of hover over the bottom for a little while here, in text mode, if I hold down the shift key, notice how it's temporarily shifting into structure selection mode, and if I lift up the key, it goes back to text mode. So the idea is that while I'm in text mode, I can quickly you know, shift into deuce mode, do a transformation, and then you know, be back in the kind of default state. OK, so we're in text mode. Now, one of the things that I'll notice about my program is that these three definitions are looking you know, rather lonely at the top. In a language you know, like Elm with, with tuples, I'll think, OK, you know, what would it look like if I put them all in a single tuple? You know, would it fit on the same line? Does it make sense to have these um, variables on the same line? And you know, doing that would involve you know, her, you know, shepherding around parentheses and commas and white space. And that kind of thing is fun. Sometimes it's a break from like, the harder parts of coding. But a lot of times, it's really tedious right, and error prone. And so you know, in this case, we ought to just have the editor be able to make those changes for us. Right? So I can select the Y definition and say, move it onto the same line as X. Okay? And it's going to take care of you know, introducing tuple patterns and tuple definitions and so forth. Similarly, I can you know, select the size definition and squeeze it into that you know, tuple and turn it into a, you know, a triple. Again, taking care of all of those you know, boring, brain-dead details that the editor certainly can do for us. OK, so, so that's good. Um, now you know, you'll notice that it's not quite a lambda yet. Um, so at this point, I'll just do some kind of text editing to add the geometric relationships. You, know, re you really don't need to think about it. I've done this example a lot, so I know, you know exactly where the um, endpoints should be snapped to. And so I'll just manually do this with text edits. And the endpoint of this second line actually needs to be at the, you know, the center of our square. And so again, I'll happily you know, do some normal coding to um, anchor my second line at the center of our, of our square. If I've typed that correctly, we've got a lambda that you know, happily moves around. OK, so great. So we've kind of repaired our program to introduce variables, introduce you know, little you know, arithmetic expressions. Now we want to start thinking about how to turn this program into you know, something reusable so we can you know, generate a bunch of different versions of this logo. And so the first thing we'll do is say, well, you know, this hard-coded list of shapes here actually ought to be a variable. Um, and so we use the introduce variable tool to you know, define a new variable at that, you know, in that white space in the program. Um, it's picked a you know, pretty good name for us, shapes, but let's make it even more descriptive. Let's call it logo. And now we actually want you know, all of the definitions that contribute to these three shapes to live you know, in the local scope of logo and not at the top level of our program. OK, and so we can use our our uh, old friend move definitions to, again, select all the definitions um, that we want to move inside the logo definition. And it's going to take care of you know, all of the kind of boring work of turning those top level definitions into local lets, you know, dealing with all the white space and things like that. Again, you know, 
not the most fun thing to do you know, manually. And furthermore, if there were kind of like dependencies that were being broken or you know, you know, accidental shadowing and things like that, the editor could you know, repair those you know, problems for us you know, before we even realize that it's a problem. In this case, there was no issue. But again, the editor ought to be able to make those kinds of simple transformations for us. OK, so we've um, shoved everything into Logo. Um, now we want to start thinking about how to make Logo a function so that you know, if we wanted to you know, make red sketch and sketch logos instead, we could do that. Right? And so one way that we can do that is to say, well, let's select certain design parameters that we actually want to become arguments. And the create function from arguments tool will move those up as parameters to Logo. And of course, it will you know, rewrite the prior use of Logo to now be a function call with those selections. Right? Again, you know, tedious operation. The type system would certainly help us you know, tell us, you know, now Logo requires three arguments. You should you know, change that call site. But again, why not have the editor automatically do those transformations for us um, in situations where it's, you know, it's simple to do? And now I've thought, OK, well, you know, I wanted red sketch and sketch logos, but I thought not to make it a parameter before. No problem. Let's make gray another parameter to our function. And you know, later on, if I was going to do something like partially apply logo to just you know, gray uh, logos in the future, I could you know, decide to reorder my arguments. Again, no problem for the editor to kind of figure out how to change all the call sites you know, to, to match these really simple changes. OK, so you can you know, experiment with the different um, boundaries of your functions in hopefully kind of a you know, quick way. OK, so we've got a function. Um, now I'm looking at what I've done here and realize that you know, I'm a terrible person. I'm not consistent with formatting. Um, so now I need to go kind of manually align all of these things. Again, well, why not have the editor you know, show me a bunch of different options for how to lay out maybe our, 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 let expression, our, our equations here. So it could show me a style where it you know, collapses all definitions onto their own lines. It could make all of the indentation equal. You know, if we're feeling really crazy, we could you know, align our equals. Um, again, the idea is that you know, while programming, I'll probably manually try all these things until I find one that I like um, or use a formatting tool. Um, but if you want to kind of like try a formatting tool in a more local way, again, the editor ought to be able to kind of quickly show us different options. Shall I take a vote? Who wants one? <laughs> Only one person. Who wants two? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. OK. I, I expected that. I'm going to pick two. Um, <laughs> OK, great, so that's good. But now I'm actually thinking, you know, these variables, these you know, three shape variables actually aren't so complicated, the definitions. We're only using them once, obviously. You know, maybe it'll actually look OK if I just put them in the same list. Maybe that'll actually be clearer for me. Um, so I can just you know, inline those three definitions, and then again, ask the format tool to like, you know, space out this list, again, you know, in a nice style so that I don't have to manually you know, try out those details on my own. OK, good, so we've got. Um, you know, a nice logo function here. We haven't talked about types at all yet. So currently, we're kind of running Sketch and Sketch in an untyped mode. And so we, right now, we'll just kind of like flip the switch and turn type checking on. And let's see what happens. Red, OK. <laughs> type errors. So what does this mean? OK, so another mode that we, you know, currently are experimenting with is what we call type inspector mode. OK, and so in type inspector mode, we can hover over different parts of the program, much like we have been doing. And in this mode, it'll kind of show us type information. OK, so you know, it figured out that this number was a number. It figured out that this string was a string. This logo variable is defined, but there's a problem. OK, what's the problem? So the problem is, is that currently in our implementation, functions need to be annotated. And then we do kind of local bidirectional inference. There's no reason, you know, go, no good reason for that. With a few more cups of coffee and a couple more days, we'll implement, you know, nice global inference too. But right now, we need annotations on functions. Okay, but the error message is kind of like, you know, saying, well, I don't know what type this function will have, but I know that it's going to have, you know, this number of arguments. So I can help you at least put in this, you know, dummy or skeleton annotation that, you know, might be useful um, in 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 addressing this problem. And so now we'll kind of escape back into text editing mode, annotate the logo function with you know, the, the types of um, arguments and, SV and outputs that we think it has. OK, there's you know, less red. What's the, the problem now? Um, the problem now is, well, our type annotation, our expected type is SVG. But actually, we're giving it a list of SVG. And so 
you know, that's a problem. It's right to, you know, yell at us. But it's actually saying, well, you know, one way that you could fix this is changing the type annotation. Did you actually get the type annotation wrong? If so, we can just, you know, hover over and choose that option to just, you know, fix that error. Right? Okay, great. All the red is gone. Um, our logo function, you know, type checked. Our main function or main definition type checked. And we can again ask the editor to, you know, we omitted that annotation, but now it's maybe more readable to, you know, document it in the code. Let's have the editor put it in the program for us. Okay, great. So now we've got, uh, you know, type checked version of our logo function. The next thing, you know, we might want to do is say, well, currently the way we've rigged this is that the caller specifies the top left corner and the, the size of the logo. But in other settings, the caller might want to say you know, where the center of the logo ought to be and its radius instead. Right? We might want different parameterizations for this design. Right? So here is where we want a union type or a data type to allow having you know, one of these two different parameterizations to be passed in. OK, so we need to kind of build up a data type that captures this, you know, this, this idea. And so the first thing that we can do um, with the tools we've implemented so far is to say, well, we can select the three uh, parameters that we're currently passing in and ask the editor to define a new type alias, you know, helpfully called num num num. <laughs> um, is that not, not a good name? <laughs> to, you know, pair those three things into a record. And you know, it'll take care of you know, changing those three you know, variable patterns into a, a, a record pattern. It's also, of course, changing the call site to create you know, a record literal of those three arguments. OK, fine. You've convinced me to rename this type um, to logo params, let's say. Um, and now you know, we need to actually make it a data type right? so that we can have different kinds of logo parameters. And so one of the tools that you know, we currently have is to say, well, you've got a type alias. Do you want to turn it into a data type? Um, and so in this case, it's going to wrap our type alias with you know, a single data constructor. Notice how what had been a record pattern as an argument is now defined as you know, an equation inside the body. And it's setting up the boilerplate of like, you know, unwrapping what had been that record type um, uh, you know, you know, for us. And then, of course, you know, the call site, again, is being you know, um, rewritten to include this new constructor. OK, so this is um, one constructor that let's call uh, let's rename, rename it to top left. And now the, you know, right now the one way that we can add new constructors to an existing data type is to select and then duplicate an existing one. OK, and so we'll duplicate uh, top left. And notice here how you know, it's gone in and filled kind of part of the you know, new pattern um, that ought to be added to the, the, the case that had been there before. And notice how in the branch for this new uh, this case, it's using what's called a, a hole or a placeholder expression to say, you know, I don't know what you're going to put here yet. And so we'll put this placeholder so everything else parses. And then you, the programmer, you know, will have to figure out what you want you know, this, this, uh, this branch to do. And so in this case, the error is saying, well, the type of this empty expression is whole unknown. Because the other branch has type, you know, num 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 or whatever you guys renamed it to earlier. It's asking us, you know, do you want to replace that expression, that whole expression, with a record of holes? Like, is that the way that you want to make progress to, um, you know, finish this this case? And in this case, you know, of course, that is what I want. Um, okay, but before I fill that in, let's go back and think about what this, you know, new constructor ought to represent. And I said that, you know, I wanted this to be um, a kind of center-based parameterization. Um, we currently don't have selection and renaming for fields. Again, with you know, one or two more cups of coffee, we'll add that too. Uh, but for now, let's just kind of manually rename our uh, record fields to center x and, and center y, uh, a radius for our, our logo. And then I'll go manually um, change my record pattern as well. OK, and now I'll you know, go in and fill the conversions between this center parameterization and the x, y size that I need to compute on this uh, branch. Um, x will be computed by offsetting radius or offsetting the center by radius. And then the size will be computed by uh, doubling the radius. OK, no more red. Um, and now if we want to you know, test this out, let's go ahead and maybe we'll just center our logo at the origin with some small size and just kind of get a sense of whether it looks like we, oops, whether we, uh oh, what did I do? Whether we got this, this right. 
Okay, so um, that's basically the example I wanted to show. One last little kind of uh, um, bit of flair we might show at the end is, you know, okay, this, this uh, nested application is not fitting nicely, obviously, so we, should ought, we ought to do something about this. Um, the format tool, again, will, you know, is show us different ways of using forward pipelining, backward pipelining, using multiple lines, you know, single lines. In this case, based on how zoomed in, zoomed in I am, uh, maybe I'll choose this option. I should have voted. I should have a lot of votes, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so that's um, basically all I wanted to, to show in the demo. So let's see if um, we can get back to the slides. I've got an extremely old version of PowerPoint, sorry. Um, okay, great. So, so that's what we wanted to, to, to demo. And so, again, the main idea that we kind of started with here is can we streamline the interface of text and structure you know, on, the, on, the, on the same uh, code box? And so we start with you know normal text box. We in our implementation we use the ACE uh, JavaScript library, um, kind of integrated into Sketch and Sketch using ports and a bunch of messy code that you know you ought not to look at. Um, but anyway, so we you know start with ACE and then we draw a, a deuce layer on top of it that has all the polygons. And the way that we start is by you know starting with the, the bounding boxes of each character, and we basically just draw polygons on top of the character boxes for. The, you know, the relevant text. So we draw a box for the function, for the argument, the space in between. And in this case, we've got a parenthesized expression you know, around the entire application. And so this you know, function application is a parent of the children, and so it sits behind the, the children expression. Um, this polygon is mostly occluded, but because there are parentheses, we've got handles on the end of them right, to get the entire application. But of course, you know, with a syntax like ours and like Elm's, um, without explicit parentheses, the question is, you know, where should we be able to grab the entire function application? And so currently, we use a really simple approach where we're just going to strip off the top and bottoms of the smaller polygons and then map those to the parent expressions. Okay, so in this example, the yellow strips are the, you know, the places where you can access the entire function call itself. Now, this allows us to get access to lots of the AST, but it's really not what we want in many situations. Like, you know, it's not intuitive in certain cases. And so in the future, we'll certainly need a, a better spatial mapping uh, onto, the, onto the text. Another thing we haven't done yet is think about, you know, how to display and deal with selections that don't fit nicely on one, you know, small screen. Um, obviously, we need to, you know, think about what the right design is for selections within a large file and across files, things like that. Um, we'll certainly, you know, be working on that soon. The next idea that um, I touched upon was using this interface to then integrate with type information and type error messages, right? So you know we're really lucky and used to having really informative error messages that describe you know what the problem is and often even like suggest a you know way forward, a way to fix the problem. And so the simple idea here is you know why not you know integrate those messages directly onto the code box itself and point to the expressions that the, you know, the, the message is referring to. And then furthermore, in cases when the, there, is, there are suggested fixes, can those just be options that can be you know, previewed and invoked directly in the code box? Right? And so in addition to informative error messages, can we make them live and direct as well? Um, another kind of idea that we saw in the demo is this goal of kind of integrating structured edits and refactorings kind of in a fine grain during the normal text editing process. And so, so far, we've hacked together a few um, example tools. In a prior version of the tool, we had you know, some more. Um, a couple of things are, are clear from this experience, though. One is you know, we're going to have a menu of tools that's you know, way too long to be usable. And so one of the things that we currently do is to use multiple selection as a way to try to narrow down the context-sensitive menu. Um, but we still need to kind of think about what the right way is to balance discoverability and usability of these transformations. Another challenge from the, uh, the code tool implementer's point of view is actually writing these transformations in the first place. And so currently, we just plug in you know, functions that take some AST and rewrite it to some other AST. And I think you know, you'll notice that a lot of these transformations are really trying to you know, take care of existing white space and add new white space correctly. These are really kind of tedious and difficult decisions to make. And even in the abstract syntax, there's lots of like stylistic choices, right? Should lets go in one order or another if there's no dependencies? Should they go into tuples or nested lets? Should the scopes be really nested or should they be flat? All of these choices are really like tedious to make in these one-off 
transformations. And so it's really not kind of a scalable way to build these in a nice way. And so in the future, you know, we certainly need to have some kind of like DSL or constraint language for tool implementers to say what they want the high level transformation to do, and then have some synthesis engine, you know, figure out the details of actually um, all of the, those choices. And as we keep, you know, doing this, one tool that I look forward to trying to, to make um, is one that would allow you to select a type and a value of that type and say, you know, this should never happen. Refactor my types and hopefully a lot of the code that, you know, manipulates it to make this state impossible. Um, that would be fun to, to try to get to work in, in, in certain cases. The last thing that I kind of touched on was how to deal with errors in your program when you, you know, haven't finished your program yet, which is most of the time when you're programming, right? And so the typical front end to your compiler is you, you know, go through a bunch of checkpoints. Hopefully your program parses into a nice tree. Hopefully your tree type checks into an annotated tree. And then hopefully your program runs to completion. But you know, obviously if you have you know, errors at any of these stages, you're basically sent back to the front of the line. Try again. And so instead, the idea is, can we localize these errors and continue down this path? So if there's a, a parse error, can we localize those and still parse you know, the tree around it? Furthermore, can we pass this you know, partial AST to the type checker and again, localize any type errors that might exist, but continue to analyze and type check the rest of the tree? And even further, can we take one of these partial trees and start running the program? <laughs> right? Because even getting one eye is better than no eyes. And furthermore, is you know, useful feedback as you go back eventually to finish the rest of your program. Right? So can you localize these errors and continue down this pipeline? And so this idea to represent incomplete programs explicitly with, with holes is really the topic of a, a project called Hazel, um, which uh, Cyrus Omar is the lead of. Um, he's a terrific postdoc in our group. He'll be talking about how to, you know, how to do this. How do you type check and even run programs that aren't finished yet? He'll be giving a talk at Strange Loop on Friday, so um, definitely check that out. Okay, so to, to recap the you know, ideas that we've kind of talked about, one is to show the abstract syntax on top of the concrete syntax. Right? Is this a way to hopefully integrate text and structured editors, which you know, I think often tend to be kind of disparate tools? Can we make them more integrated? Once we've done that, can we integrate type information directly onto this kind of user interface as well? Another idea is, you know, are there sets of code tools, structured edits and, and refactorings that are useful throughout the editing process and not just kind of late stage refactorings? You know, I'm certainly not saying that what the tools that, you know, we've shown so far are like, you know, the end all be all, but the idea is can we have a workflow where we're using both of these effectively? And the last thing uh, I mentioned was this idea of representing incomplete programs explicitly to give kind of more uh, conti continuous and live feedback during the editing process. And so we're really, you know, early stages into this implementation. Um, we really have implemented just enough of the type system and just enough of these code tools to get this demo to work. Um, you know, we have lots of work, you know, going forward, but, you know, we think that, you know, we can kind of keep building this up towards, you know, a realistic, um, you know, subset of an Elm-like language. And, you know, I hope that, you know, sometime soon we can even you know, imagine using this as like the ID for this, this Elm class that we teach at Chicago to really start to kind of, you know, learn about how people, you know, might use both structured edits and text edits in a kind of non-trivial um, setting. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, um, this is a collaboration with a really terrific bunch of students. Um, Grant showed that awesome diagram of the horse and the goat. I'm really the goat in this um, picture. You know, the hard work and the, the thanks really goes to um, all the folks on this slide. Also, thanks, you know, we've been lucky to get funding to kind of support this research. And then, you know, last and not, not least, you know, thanks to Evan and this community for building the tools that we're using to do this, this work. Um, and thanks to Brian and Luke for actually, you know, organizing an event like this where we can, you know, share, share cool ideas. So if you'd like to learn more, um, please take a look at our project page. Um, you know, we've got some videos, some demos, some things to read. Um, we would love to, to hear what you think. Thanks for your time. So if I'm not mistaken, I think there is time for questions. Um, are there questions? Uh, one point that you didn't really focus on is what your target audience is. So I found it interesting that you started talking about educational uses at the end. 
um, because I was thinking about it as an engineer the whole time. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like there's particular uses that you want to see of this in educational context and are there features that you want to build in that direction specifically? That's a great question. So you're right, I didn't, I didn't oh, the question was target audience. Is it you know, engineers, is it just me, is it you know, classroom setting? Um, target audience really is anybody, everybody. Programmers. Um, the reason I think I mentioned you know education as maybe a first kind of s setting in which to explore this is because, like I said, you know this works for our, our interface currently works for like single code box and like small kinds of you know settings. It's a lot of work to kind of get this to scale up to be able to replace the kind of tool chain you use, right? Like that's just too much work for us in the short term. We need to kind of get more understanding of how the design should work before it can be scaled up for you know you know for you to use. And so in a classroom setting, you know, I can design a bunch of you know, data structures and algorithms assignments where we can get things to work nicely for you know, the 40 line programs they're gonna write. And then you know, if that goes well, that's kind of maybe some reason to start trying to get to the, I don't know, you probably write four million lines of code or something, you know, try to scale it up to a real setting. But, so I think that's why I kind of ordered it that way. But the idea is general purpose programming. This one? Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Thanks. Um, so I, I use, uh, like for example, Atom, and there are some packages you can install to like, to manually, sorry, like to automatically do some refactoring for you, right? But I never use them because it doesn't like, I don't know which one to choose. I don't know what it means. Right. Um, is there any thought put into like, say, I start changing names of some variables, or I start changing some value into uh, variable names, like detecting that and suggesting, oh, are you changing variables? How about selecting and telling me um, which other values you want to change in the same variable, and let me like right. fit into your workflow instead. Right, so that's a great, great, great question. Um, the, the comment was, um, we never use the refactorings in Atom because there are too many, and it's you know, just hard to know which to even look at, so have we worked on trying to suggest to the user based on edits they're making, like, oh, did you want to also replace all these you know, occurrences by using some tool? The short answer is no, we haven't you know, thought about that yet, but the longer answer is yes, we definitely ought to do stuff like that. Um, one related kind of idea that comes to mind is, um, so there's a, a, a nice paper and project that I like called Refactoring with Synthesis. The idea there is you tell the system, hey, I'm gonna start a refactoring. I don't know what refactoring to use yet, but I know that I want the result of my refactoring to do this thing to my program. So you highlight some expression, you delete it, you, re, you know, write the variable x, and then you say, infer the transformations that will result in this piece of code later saying x. By also doing you know, other changes like defining what x actually is. But the idea there is kind of, you know, the programmer is starting to give an example of what they want, and then the tool can hopefully try to put together the tools that it knows about to achieve that goal. Um, so trying to do something like that in a, with kind of more and finer grain tools, I think maybe would start to get to this workflow, but we haven't really thought hard about how to, how to, try, how to try that. If you know, please come tell us. Um, you mentioned that there were, uh, at the beginning you mentioned there were a bunch of languages that you essentially felt were equivalent in this case. Um, but obviously some transformations work better in other languages, preserve things in other languages. Do you have a good sense of how to do the mapping from language features and capabilities to valid transformations and getting that exhaustive list of transformations? That's a good question. So he, this uh, question is calling me out for flippantly equating all of these languages um, and saying that, of course, some transformations actually you know, need type information or various things. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, the kinds of transformations I showed so far are all are all so simple that it really doesn't matter yet. In fact, most of the tools that we implemented you know, early in the demo you know, didn't use type information at all. Um, but you're right, of course, you know, given the particular set of language features, then you can design you know, specific transformations. And so, you know, of course, um, they will be language specific. Um, but I think a lot, of the, a lot of the basic things you do, right, defining variables and those kinds of things, those certainly will be you know, applicable across. But then given some cool set of features, your language has you know, specific transformations for that set. Hello, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, a question I have um, around uh, the IDE is, 
Are you thinking about um, showing a partial execution or a partial sort of like non-visual representation sort of in line with the code? Absolutely. And so, um, so the Hazel project that I mentioned at the end of the talk, um, Cyrus will be talking about a strange loop. One of the focuses there is, yeah, how do you provide you know, information in kind of like a live debugger for the partial program that has been run? And of course, most of the programs that we're writing and running you know, have intermediate computations that are not necessarily pictures or something, right? And so how do you have a debugger where you can you know, drill iteratively into a computation to learn more about what has happened and kind of drill back? So we haven't, in this editor, we're certainly not doing any of that. In the Hazel project, he's starting. To, they're starting to kind of explore. Yeah, how do you de develop a kind of like live debugger in this this mode where you've got partial program execution? Um, yeah, take a take a look at what we're up to over there. Hi. Uh, how are you? If if you do it at all, how are you quantifying how your improvements and changes? Um, improve the user experience um, over time. So the, the danger is that we mistake ourselves for our users when we build software often. And if you're working on the same product over and over again, how do you know that you're not making things more difficult because mm -hmm. you're adding more things, but because your users are more familiar with it, mm -hmm. you don't account for new users being able to use it? That's a great question. So the question's about usability. Um, how do we know this is not just making things worse? <laughs> um, we don't yet, and so an initial user study that we have um, done, so in a, whoops. So maybe I'll just gonna show this slide. I haven't read this in a while, so let me see what it says. <laughs> okay, so in a, in a kind of simpler setting, it was kind of a smaller language with explicit parentheses, no types, a um, lot fewer syntax features. What we did do was run a study with you know, users that didn't build the tool, right, of course, and basically tried to compare the new user interface that we designed to a more traditional kind of um, workflow that you find in a refactoring tool like Eclipse or IntelliJ, where the workflow there is, you know, there are, of course, they've got tons of transformations, but the user interface there is you make a single text selection somewhere in your code, and then you get you know, your menu, and then you configure the, that tool in like a configuration wizard. So that was kind of like the more traditional workflow compared to our um, kind of visual multiple selection workflow. And so in that kind of narrow, so to do a comparison between those two user interfaces, we designed several small structured editing and refactoring tasks in a kind of small lab setting. And you know, we found that there's a learning curve to learn this tool, but it seemed like you know, once people had either done previous tasks, tasks or knew what tools were in the tool, that then they were you know, slightly faster perhaps performing that transformation. But again, this is a you know, small laboratory study, but it, didn't, it at least didn't tell us that this is definitely a bad idea. <laughs> like it was encouraging that you know, there is a learning curve, and so maybe we ought to address that kind of problem if you know, we're gonna keep pushing on this direction. But yeah, of course, usability is a great you know, question. Thanks, everyone, for the great questions, and thanks, Ravi, for the excellent talk. Thank you.